Good morning. Oh. <coughs> oh, oh, good morning. And how are you doing today? Hope you're having another wonderful day. Today we are continuing our travel through Morocco with the Land Rover. Lara, when we set off from Scotland, we've done northern Morocco. We've headed to the coast at the Casablanca, down into the craziness of Marrakesh. And now it is time to get familiar with the Sahara Desert. Now, south of Marrakesh is a place called Eight Ben Hedu. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Now, it has it's a location that has been used in many, many movies through the years. It is an old village that's now basically abandoned. There's a few people living around it, and it's all old crumbling buildings built up a hillside on the desert's edge. It really is a fantastic location. I'll pop up on the screen here just some of the movies that have used this as a movie set location. It really is beautiful and we were fortunate when we went there there was no movie going, there was hardly anybody there. In fact, I'm not sure we saw anybody else there. One of the upside downside of the timing of our journey, this was in 2001, just after the 9-11 uh, incident in New York with the Twin Towers, which meant that a lot of countries, tourism where there was Muslim, um, where Islam and Muslim was strong, Morocco being one of them, foreigners had fled the country. And so there was very, very little movement in tourism. Everybody was terrified as what was going on. We were just very happy because everywhere we went, people were so happy to see us and distance themselves from that incident and welcome us and make sure we were safe. And we had the places like in 8 Ben Hedu to ourselves, which was wonderful for me. We went round and uh, walked amongst these ruins to imagine the history that had happened there. It really is a remarkably beautiful place. And we'd been on the road a couple of months now because we set off in October and Christmas was coming. Now, one of the things that I mentioned before Morocco is that even though it's tourism quiet, the locals don't really leave you alone. Um, first of all, they're very curious about you. And secondly, you're a source of income. They want to sell you something. I appreciate that, but it can get quite annoying. So we decided Christmas Day was coming. We stocked up with a few things in Marrakesh in the supermarkets there, and we were going to drive into the Sahara Desert, hide ourselves amongst the sand dunes, and have Christmas Day in the Sahara Desert. And that is exactly what we did. We drove uh, east from Eight Ben Hedu through some beautiful landscape until the villages and everything disappeared and it just became sand dunes. And, of course, having a Land Rover, nice four-wheel drive, we managed to chug into the sand dunes and we found a nice little niche where we tucked in behind three sand dunes, made a little camp, put a big tarpaulin over the top, and we settled in for Christmas Day in the Sahara Desert. And we, that night we camped under the stars. It was absolutely beautiful. There's one desert, if you ever get a chance to go to the desert, go somewhere where there's no lights, turn up all the lights, look up, and you will see the most amazing amount of stars that you can imagine and shooting stars. It's, it's just, it is beautiful, it's magical. Something you will never forget. Next morning, Christmas morning came, not a person in sight. It was a beautiful, beautiful clear day. Now, I didn't have a turkey, couldn't cook a traditional Christmas dinner, but I did have a chicken and we did cook it. Now, previously I'd been a safari guide working in Namibia and I knew how to cook out in the deserts and out in the wild. So we made an oven in the ground, we dug a hole, made some charcoal, wrapped the chicken up, put lots of spices and butter in with it, put it in the ground. We had vegetables, we had gravy and roast chicken in the Sahara Desert for Christmas Day. It was quite unique and quite special. And another day I will never forget. In the afternoon, we played frisbee and badminton. <laughs> in the desert. Yes, we'd bought a frisbee and we'd bought some badminton rackets and a few shuttles. They didn't last that long though, but um, yes. Um, in the desert in the afternoon, we actually then record a video message to our family that we sent to them about two years later because we didn't have any other method of sending it until then. Um, and Christmas Day was quite an amazing day. It was um, very unique. And the Sahara Desert, 
even that part which is just the western edge of the Sahara Desert is very very beautiful very daunting as well I mean it's a huge huge desert so we went to bed happy that night in the morning got up we were going to spend boxing day there as well the day after Christmas day we were just going to chill decide on our next plan and um, I'm sitting uh, on top of the sand dune looking around and I can see over the sand dunes this little dot sort of moving along and I thought well that's that's from inside the desert there's what is that when got a bit by nose I looked at the by nose there's a guy pushing a bicycle <laughs> over the sand dunes and he spotted us and he is coming straight towards us and I'm going I don't believe it even in the Sahara Desert after one day of not seeing another person the one person that's out here pushing his bicycle through the desert is going to come and see us. And sure enough, an hour later, he arrived at the camp. And he sat at the sand, top, put his bike at the top of the sand dune, wandered down to the camp, and he was greeting us and didn't understand what language he was. And he reached in his pockets and he pulled out, fossil, fossil. <laughs> and it's like, had a couple of rocks in his, in his pocket. And I, I don't know, no, we're not going to buy fossils. And he goes, Okay, and he just tosses them down on the ground, like, really? It, um, but it did lead to something that we thought, well, what we've learned is that when Moroccans get up in the morning, they do their usual things, they, they go to the bathroom, they get dressed, they have the breakfast, and then they pack to go out, and they, they pack all their things, and, you know, they pack some water, and then they say, well, okay, just in case, I'll pick up a couple of rocks in case I encounter some tourists, and then I can sell them to them as fossils, maybe make a quick buck off them. That became a joke because everywhere we went, everybody had something to sell us in Morocco. And fossils were a very common one, especially in this part. And, it, and like I said, I don't know whether they really were fossils or not, because most of the time when you didn't buy them, they just tossed them down on the ground. They could have got a pick anyway. <laughs> so we said no, he tossed them down on the ground. But then this enormous sand, sand storm swept in. It really blew out of nowhere. I mean, you see it in the movies as it happened, but in the morning, the sky was blue, blue and clear. And then it just, like midday, got dark. And over the night, and the guy in the bike, he knew what was happening. He went, he went and sat on top of the sand dune, huddled down behind his bike, put his hood up, because he had a jump run as well, put his hood up, and just went like this. And... I looked at the oncoming storm and thought, oh boy, so we actually had a, a tarpaulin rigged up. We rigged the tarpaulin, and took everything and put everything in the back of the Land Rover. And we then went and sat inside the Land Rover. And then this storm just, boom, it just went dark. Sand whipping everywhere, the Land Rover was shaking. I was thinking that poor guy just sitting out in the, you know, just basically huddled up in the sand dune. Um, and it only lasted about half an hour, but boy, that was a long, dark, and quite terrifying half an hour. Um, and then, poof, it was gone as quickly as it arrived. Blue sky came out again. We opened the doors. There was sand piled up onto the, onto the front of the Land Rover, brushing it all off, and some sand had got in. Land Rovers aren't very airproof, sandproof. <laughs> it's cleaning everything out. And this guy on top of the sand dune, it just... Completely covered in sand. He wakes up, sh shakes all the sand off him, shakes his bike, looks at us, puts a hand in his pocket and says, Do you want to buy fossils? <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. No fossils. Okay. He puts them back in his... And off he goes, pushing his bike through the desert. Goodness knows where he'd come from or where he was going. But there we go. <laughs> fossils in the desert. So that was Christmas and Boxing Day. So then we'd been poring over the map and we've got this book called Across the Sahara, which was our only guide to crossing the Sahara, written by Chris Scott. Thank you, Chris Scott, for all your wonderful advice, if you ever hear this, many years later. This was 20 years ago we bought this book. I don't know if he's uh, still selling the book, but if you're thinking of crossing the Sahara Desert, I highly recommend using this book as a guide. Maybe he's updated it. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, but Jennifer had been reading through this. And she went, look, there's this wonderful place called Figwig. I don't know if it's called Figwig, but we called it Figwig. And it's the place of a 100,000 date palm trees on the edge of the desert. It's meant to be one of the most spectacular um, sites in the edge of the Sahara. Oh, well, that sounds good. Let's plot it out on the map. 
and uh, see where it is because it, we, we must be close to it. And so we, we look, we look at the map and, uh, and we are in the area. It's, it's, it's further east from us. And I thought, like, but then when we calculate, it's actually 600 kilometers east of us straight into the Sahara Desert to get to this place. And then when you get there, because it's on the Algerian border, the only thing you can do is turn around and come all the way back to where we were. So it's going to be a 1200 kilometer diversion to see some trees on the edge of the desert. I said, no, we're not going to make that diversion. No, no let's not. And uh, it then became ironically, um, uh, iconically known as, you know, when we did a diversion somewhere, we said, we hope this is not a figgy wig diversion that goes 1200 kilometers around. Instead, we went back across the desert's edge to a place called Wazazat. Again, I don't know if that's pronounced that way. I'll put the name up here for you. And Wazazat is a valley with a river right on the edge of the desert. And it is beautiful. We hit the time of year nicely. Some of the um, foliage was changing in the trees. And there's some historic uh, like castles, which are called kasbahs, uh, mounted on... Uh, the cliff's edge, and we rocked up and we found this deserted ca deserted ruined Kasbah. I mean, hundreds of years old. Nothing had been there. We used four-wheel drive, drove right into the Kasbah, parked up, explored it. It was just roll rotten walls falling down of mud and brick, perched beautifully high on this cliff with fantastic views over the surrounding valley and all the growing and fruit growing that was going growing in the valley beside uh, the river down below us. And we camped there for the night and it was stunningly beautiful. Uh, the, and we had a full moon that night. We were sitting there around the campfire. The moon came up illuminating um, the lunar rays over the valley. You could actually see in the moonlight. It was so beautiful. And there's lots of these sort of ruins dotted around the desert's edge, which used to be forts for the various tribes that lived in the area and have now been deserted from here. And your imagination just goes wild with what has happened and what those places have seen. But if you're heading that way, Wazazat is well worth a visit. It is a beautiful landscape area and it's got the, where the desert and the river meet and there's it, and the history, beautiful. So that was the desert. Now was time to go to the coast. So we headed west to the coast to Agadir, where, you, where the coast road from, um, from down the coast of Morocco, hits the Atlantic Ocean, and then goes all the way down the coast to Mauritania, which will be our next country, but we'll come to that next video. Um, and one thing we noticed as we got closer and closer to Agadir, on the road were these big motorhome vehicles. And I'm not talking, you know, your little, you know, like our conversion, big motorhomes, um, full on four beds, kitchen, toilet, bathroom, everything inside motorhomes from Europe rolling down towards the coast. So we think, is there some sort of convention or something going on? I mean, this is, this is not, we hadn't seen a single motorhome since we'd left Europe. In fact, we'd barely seen any foreign vehicles at all. And now there was dozens of these things. And when we got to the coast, we found out why. Because it is beautiful coastline. I mean, amazing coastline. The Atlantic Sea isn't exactly swim friendly, but the beaches are beautiful. But that coast is very surf friendly. And when we roll down to a bit of the coach, uh, coast, we, there's an access down to the beach. And we found lots of these motorhomes dotted along the beach. And we went and spoke to a few of them. And some of them came to see us because, you know, there are all these big motorhomes fully equipped. And there's our Land Rover with sand plates and having to unpack everything every day and sleep on the roof. They were fascinated with us as well. And it turns out that from the, a lot of Europeans, the French, the Germans, and the Dutch, they have these big motorhomes. And for the winter and for Christmas and New Year, a lot of them drive them down the coast and basically spend a couple of weeks holiday in their motorhome on the beach in southern Morocco, enjoying the peace and the quiet. And a lot of them like to surf and fish, basically sitting on. And there was dozens of these big motorhomes and then one day I must have come to the end of the holidays they packed up poof and they were all gone gone and we were the only people sitting on the beach it was really surrealistic but but it's a beautiful landscape down there and um, but 
quite windy off the coast because basically you've got the hot desert land and the cold Atlantic Ocean so there's always a wind one way or another so you get dehydrated you get a cold wind during the day and a hot wind when you're trying to sleep during the night but now we have to go further south because we're going to leave Morocco behind and we're going to head down into the south south of Morocco now this wasn't our first choice because our original plan was to go along the north coast of Africa and then down the east coast to South Africa. So the original plan, and we got visas to go to Morocco, then Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, into Egypt, and then from Egypt down into Sudan and the south route. But, as I mentioned earlier, 9-11 had just happened and everyone was very nervous and worried about what was going on. The Americans were making moves on the Middle East. It was like, hmm. So our plan to go along the west, uh, the northern coastline got scuppered because Tunisia and Libya both then suddenly revoked all visas for foreigners traveling to the countries, which basically meant our route across the northern coast of Africa had been blocked. And I was really looking forward to exploring Libya. This was pre-invasion days and I mean it, the history there is, is fantastic a lot of it is unfortunately now being destroyed but and I didn't get to see it so we had to change a plan we looked at the map and thought well the options we've got are to trace our way back to Europe right through Europe through the Middle East and try and get to Egypt that way and down the coast but of course covering going through the Middle East in those days eh, probably as easy as it is nowadays not very and quite dangerous so we decided to go down the west coast of Africa and then see if we could drive across the Sahara Desert. Must be much easier than going through the Middle East, hey? So from the coast of Agadir, we headed south down the coast into what's called the Western Sahara. Now this is a disputed territory. Morocco claims it is theirs. The local tribes say um, they want to be independent, but it, it belongs to the Kingdom of Morocco. It's a bit confusing and it's a little bit dangerous, even in those days. So you get to the edge and there's a name of a town, Lafay, Lafay, I'll put it up here. <laughs> because you can't drive through the Western Sahara by yourself. You have to go in a military convoy. And uh, they drive you right through the um, Western Sahara in two days. It's a big chunk. It, it's not a little journey. Um, you overnight in Dakla um, halfway and then you go down the rest of the way to the border at Naudibu the following day. So, uh, and it goes once a week or used to go once a week then. So we arrived um, a couple of days before it was due to go to make sure because you've got to get your paperwork checked, get stamped out of Morocco there, do your paperwork, get your vehicle checked, get a few supplies. And then a couple of days in the morning, we headed off bright and early in the morning, just in the, because they go early, early, like uh, 3 a.m. Um, the first three or four hours are completely in the dark and it's a desert gravel road and you're in a convoy and all you're doing is following the lights of the vehicle in front. Um, so there's a couple of military trucks, a couple of armoured vehicles and then there was about 20 vehicles going through. So we trundled through to Dakla, um, got there for the night and then basically it's not a camping site, there's nothing provided, basically it's a military camp. Um, with minefield around it, guards, barbed wire, you drive into the camp, you stop, wherever you stop, that's where you're going to camp for the night. So, uh, and it had been a long day, it was dark when we set off and it was dark when we arrived. We then uh, camped there for the night, made some food, had quite a nervous sleep because we heard gunfire in the night and you know, you, you know, you're in a precarious area, you don't know what's going on. And um, although the soldiers, you know, seemed very efficient, they didn't really fill you with confidence that they would protect you if something went wrong. So it was our first very nervous night in the Western Sahara. Um, and you'd heard lots of stories <laughs> that uh, from other people of the terrible things that happened. But nothing happened to us, thankfully. Next morning, 3 a.m., we're up and ready to roll again. Uh, again, they do a full paperwork check, even there. And it's your uh, final... Uh, time in Morocco and we rolled south 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 to a place called Naudibu which is Naudibu is actually in Mauritania but the convoy goes to the edge of it then you're stamped into Mauritania you cross into Naudibu 
and there's one place to stay for the night and it's a sort of a, a hotel campsite thing a sort of a, it, it's quite it's been like a fort because you camp inside the hotel grounds so there's big walls around I say hotel very loosely great big walls with very basic rooms and very basic facilities and you park in the middle and you camp for the night uh, we camp for the night because our next move is going down the coast to, into Mauritania and um, we were the only four-wheel drive vehicle there all the rest were this crazy group of French people who every year what they did is in France they got together and they bought really cheap vehicles like any cheap vehicles not two-wheel drive any cheap vehicle they could do and then they drove them down to Mauritania sold them in the capital of Mauritania Nauchot I think it was Nauchot and then flew home to France and that was their holiday every year and um, the access from the Western Sahara Naudibu down to Naukachot is not by road it's on the beach and basically because the Sahara sweeps all the way to the coast then and basically what you have to do is wait till the tide goes out then you drive down the beach while the tide's out when the tide comes in you move up onto the sand dunes a little bit and you camp the tide goes out you drive down to the capital Naukachot um, so of course all these people with their crappy cheap cars were very keen to have us join their convoy for protection but really what they needed was a four-wheel drive to help them when they got stuck and we were the only four-wheel drive there so we upset them by saying no we've got our own timetable um, we're going to go by ourselves because also we knew that we could drive much faster on these sand dunes and these sandy conditions than they could and yeah anyway um, so we were out of favour with that group at that night, but next day we were going to go and explore Mauritania. But there was one catch first. First, to leave Naudibu, to get down onto that beach, you have to cross the minefields of the southern western Sahara. So that is what we're going to be doing next time.